The Subcommittee on Space and Aeronautics will now uh, come to order. Uh, without objection, the chair is authorized to declare recesses of the subcommittee <clears throat> at any time. Welcome to today's hearing uh, <clears throat> entitled ISS and Beyond, the Present and Future of American Low Earth Orbit Activities. <clears throat> and now uh, I uh, would like to recognize myself for five minutes for an opening statement. Today's subcommittee hearing will address the ongoing activities of the United States in low Earth orbit, <coughs> excuse me, and as well as the path to a future low Earth orbit that is occupied by a range of government, private, and international actors. Last month, this subcommittee considered the role of NASA's Artemis program in establishing America as a leader in human space exploration on the moon. Our hearing today will focus on human space exploration activities that are a bit closer to home, but no less important. Over 20 years ago, the United States established a continuous human presence in space through the International Space Station, which we all know as the ISS, weighing over 900,000 pounds and spanning the distance of a football field, the International Space Station is the largest single human-built structure in space. This one-of-a-kind research platform orbits 250 miles above Earth at 17,500 miles per hour and offers researchers several unique scientific opportunities, including access to a consistent microgravity environment and the extreme conditions of outer space. Not only is the ISS a technological wonder, but it also represents impressive achievements in international cooperation and foreign policy. The ISS partnership involves five space agencies from 15 countries, and researchers from over 100 countries have conducted science tied to the ISS. Congress has extended the lifespan of the ISS program multiple times, most recently directing NASA to continue operations until 2030. While ISS continues to yield several impressive scientific discoveries, the station is showing signs of aging. NASA has solicited industry input for a U.S. deorbit vehicle capable of safely deorbiting the station by burning it up on reentry. And I hope to learn more today from NASA about the process that they use to determine that this vehicle is the best approach for deorbiting and about how they calculated the proposed cost. Congress must consider the United States' objectives for low Earth orbit, also known as LEO and plan for a future that does not rely on the ISS. Selecting the correct approach will depend upon a range of factors, many of which we will explore in today's hearing. First, we must assess how LEO activities promote the national interest. What does the United States seek to accomplish in LEO? What are the consequences of a gap in the United States' LEO presence? How will we maintain the international relationships that we've grown through that have grown through uh, ISS, and how are other nations, friendly or otherwise, moving forward with LEO activities? And then we must understand NASA's role in these objectives. What research priorities must NASA complete before ISS retirement or transition? How do NASA's LEO activities facilitate other human space exploration activities? Finally, we must understand the developing commercial marketplace for LEO activities and services. How can commercial providers facilitate NASA goals? Will these commercial uh, capabilities be available before retirement of ISS? We have asked for answers to these questions in previous legislative efforts, and we continue to stress the importance of obtaining clarity on these points to inform future LEO activities in a post-ISS world. <clears throat> we also cannot forget that America already faces international competition in LEO. When ISS was constructed, it was the only facility of its kind. Today, the Chinese Communist Party operates a space station that has hosted uh, Taikonauts in LEO since 2021. The CCP has also solicited international partnerships to conduct research activities on this station. If another station is not operable by the time ISS retires, the Chinese station may be the only 
human-occupied station available to scientists for LEO research. The committee must consider how to address all of these factors as it drafts a NASA authorization bill. Today's discussion will inform those legislative efforts and allow us to provide NASA with a clear direction at this critical moment in space innovation. Of course, I have a very strong interest in this effort. For years, Houston has been the leader in LEO activities. Not only does Houston host the Johnson Space Center, which manages the ISS program, but Houston also is home to an array of space companies with innovative ideas for commercial use of LEO. But this is an issue bigger than just Houston. It impacts scientists, companies, and governments all around the world. How we respond to this challenge will have far-reaching effects, so it's very important that we get this right. So I want to thank our panel of witnesses. I really appreciate our impressive uh, witnesses here this morning uh, for coming and sharing your experience and your expertise on this matter. And I look forward to our discussion and questions and answers. So I now recognize the ranking member for his statement. Thank you, Chairman Babin, uh, for holding today's hearing. Uh, the present and future of American low er Earth orbit activities, the ISS and beyond. I want to extend a warm welcome uh, to our expert witnesses. Thank you all for your time and, uh, and sharing uh, everything that you have for us today. Uh, this year will mark 24 years of continuous crew occupation on the International Space Station, a long and cohesive international partnership with 15 countries, over 3,000 experiments carried out to date. Last year, I was proud to welcome NASA astronaut Dr. Kate Rubens to my district. During her visit, Dr. Rubens spoke about her excitement for the upcoming generation. She and I both believe that the first explorers to Mars are in first grade today. What an exciting opportunity that this is for our nation's kids. The scientific research currently done on the ISS is critical to our explorers getting to the surface of Mars. I want to recognize the talented and dedicated NASA workforce and the NASA astronauts Jasmine Mokbeli, Laurel O'Hara, as well as European astronaut Andreas Mogensen and Japanese astronaut Furukawa Satoshi. They're orbiting 250 miles above us right now. These brave astronauts make our present and our future in low Earth orbit possible. The International Space Station is an international success story that the world can be proud of, and I believe that there's so much more to come. In Congress, most recent NASA authorization, ISS operations were extended through the year 2030 with planned deorbiting to follow that. This hearing is intended to examine how close we are to maintaining this critical timeline. Continuing to benefit from this incredible laboratory uh, requires that NASA take prompt action. We must replace the aging ISS spacesuits that could pose serious risks to our astronauts. And we must develop a deorbit vehicle in time to safely control the station's return to Earth over the Pacific Ocean without risking any lives. According to the Congressionally Chartered Aerospace Safety Advisory Panel, the safety of deorbiting the ISS is not completely in NASA's hands. This is because a catastrophic failure could occur with little or no warning. Furthermore, NASA is planning to transition from being owner and operator of the ISS to user and customer of one or more commercial space stations. As we nurture the success of ISS today, we must vigilantly prepare for the future of low Earth orbit. It's a consequential shift, and we need to make sure we get it right. Many questions remain at this time. What will be the roles for government and non-government in this changing low Earth orbit model? What are the geopolitical implications of ending an international space station? Who will be responsible for safety of NASA's astronauts on commercial space uh, stations? Is there a market to support a commercial low Earth orbit enterprise? 
How will the science currently done aboard the ISS continue during this change? And should there be a national laboratory in low Earth orbit? The year 2030, it's not that far off. I hope today's hearing provides fulsome answers as the committee looks to continue its important role um, to make sure that we're doing what's right. A new decade of science that both inspires and enables our continued leadership, it awaits us today. The United States must seize this moment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield. Thank you, Mr. Sorensen. Appreciate that. And now I'd like to recognize the ranking member of the full committee for a statement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and ranking member. The Science Committee is often referred to as the Committee of the Future, and the future of low Earth orbit is a fitting topic to be considered by this committee. I recall on the committee there was some division uh, when the committee was looking at authorizing uh, the ISS um, and we were building it and talking about it, but I think time has proven the proponents of ISS to be correct. The ISS uh, laid the foundation for America's future in low Earth orbit and beyond, and it demonstrates our increasingly important leadership of a 15-nation partnership. Now, this is a strategic and soft power capability for the U.S., and it's as important today as it was in 1998 when the ISS Intergovernmental Agreement was signed. Uh, the ISS has also uh, allowed for the growth of the U.S. commercial launch industry. Uh, NASA's investment in ISS commercial crew and cargo capabilities have reinvigorated our U.S. commercial launch industry, bringing us positive economic impact and competitiveness. And in addition, the ISS has served as a long-term orbiting microgravity laboratory. It enables basic and applied research, such as the work of the Space Biosciences Division at NASA Ames. It's just outside my district. And it provides a platform for other federal government agencies, as well as commercial entities, uh, to carry out R&D. However, as has been mentioned, uh, it won't last forever. It's aging and currently only authorized through 2030. Now, NASA wants to continue to use low Earth orbit for research, uh, technology risk reduction, and other activities. And NASA plans to transition those efforts to commercial space stations, for which NASA plans to be one of many customers. Now, there are lots of questions about this transition. Uh, in many ways, this hearing is a convergence of two major space policy areas the committee has and will be considering over the rest of this Congress, commercial space regulatory frameworks and NASA reorganization, reauthorization. The committee has to balance the public interest uh, and NASA with the commercial space industry, as well as ensure that U.S. taxpayer investments are protected. I want to give a, a little bit of thought to the risks of transitioning national and government activities to non-governmental entities. It could include a potential gap in U.S. presence in low Earth orbit, or the safety of NASA astronauts, the financial risk to the U.S. government should NASA end up representing the only sustainable market for commercial space stations, and potential liability risks uh, to the United States government, which is responsible for all U.S non-governmental activities in space. This committee has to uh, sort out who's going to be responsible and how those risks are evaluated. The committee also has to consider the nature of government-funded research and development in a post-ISS environment. It's critical that NASA ensure a seamless transition from the ISS to commercial platforms. But the essential role of government-sponsored microgravity research and development can't get lost in the shuffle. The U.S. government and this committee have a responsibility to ensure such an outcome does not occur. The United States isn't alone in this domain, as has been mentioned by the chairman. Uh, China established its crewed Tiangong space station in low Earth orbit and is investing much of the same cutting-edge science that we'll hear more about today from our expert witnesses. 
space biological and physical sciences directly enable human exploration. So we need to lead in science to lead on our efforts to go to the moon and Mars. And finally, I want to voice my concern about the budgetary challenges and really the dysfunctional appropriations process that we have that's uh, threatening our nation's plans in space. Uh, if we in Congress aren't prepared to appropriate the required resources, um, we will not be successful. Continuing to operate the ISS while also procuring a deorbit vehicle and providing support to commercial LEO destinations really does require sustained investments if we're going to make sure that America stays first in low Earth orbit. So I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman. I look forward to hearing from this panel of really very distinguished witnesses, and I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, well, let me introduce our witnesses. Um, our first witness today is uh, Mr. Kenneth Bowersox, who brings a unique perspective to today's discussion. Uh, as a former NASA astronaut who spent five and a half months aboard the ISS, uh, Mr. Bowersox currently serves as the Associate Administrator for NASA's Space Operations Mission Directorate. Uh, his responsibilities include the management of NASA's human space exploration efforts, including ISS operations and the development of future commercial space stations. Prior to this, Mr. Bowersox served as the Deputy Associate Administrator for Space Operations. Our next witness uh, is Dr. Mary Lynn Dittmar, the Chief Government and External Relations Officer at Axiom Space. Uh, her responsibilities include directing Axiom's work with the U.S. government. She also serves as the industry co-chair of the FAA's Commercial Human Space Flight Occupant Safety Rulemaking Committee. Previously, Dr. Dittmar served as the founding president and CEO of the Coalition for Deep Space Exploration. Both of you are, are welcome. Our third witness is Dr. Robert Furrell, who co-chairs the National Academy's uh, Decadal Survey on Biological and Physical Sciences Research in Space for 2023 to 2032. In this role, he is overseeing the development of guidance strategy for NASA's next decade of biological and physical science research. I'll recognize Mr. Bauer. You may not be on. Yeah. I, I, I'm not good with buttons. You know, that, that was a problem when I was flying, too. <laughs> so Chairman Babin and uh, Ranking Member Sorensen uh, uh, and other members of the subcommittee, uh, thank you for the opportunity to appear today to discuss NASA's human space flight, space flight activities in low Earth orbit, uh, which we call LEO. Uh, since 1998, NASA and our international commercial partners uh, have used the International Space Station, ISS for short, to expand scientific research, technology development, and economic activities into the unique microgravity environment beyond Earth. ISS astronauts have worked with many highly skilled researchers on the ground to conduct scientific experiments in areas such as medicine, plant and animal biology, biotechnology, fundamental physics, crystal growth, combustion science, and fluid physics. We've looked back at our home planet, increasing our knowledge of the atmosphere, oceans, and land as we work to understand the impacts of climate change. We've increased our knowledge of the effects of space on the human body, helping us to un better understand disease and develop new treatments to lengthen and improve lives on Earth. Through the ISS, we're learning critical lessons that will enable humanity's next steps into deep space through the Artemis campaign, deepening and broadening international partnerships, as well as promoting the development of a sustainable commercial market in LEO. ISS serves as a hub for U.S. commercial cargo and crew transportation. Uh, the development of domestic launch vehicles for these spacecraft has resulted in the reemergence of the United States as the global leader in space launch activities. SpaceX's Dragon and Northrop Grumman's Cygnus cargo ships regularly supply research experiments and consumables to the station. They will be joined this year by Sierra Space's Dream Chaser, um, and we expect seven more flights of, uh, or we've flown seven flights of the Crew Dragon, and we've got one more coming up here at the uh, end of this month. Um, in May of uh, 2020, um, we expect uh, to have flown the Starliner, um, Boeing spacecraft, uh, and uh, something that's really exciting to me is over the past uh, couple years, we've flown three private astronaut missions with Axiom to the International Space Station. 
While the several, last several years have seen enormous progress, we did suffer a setback in May of 2023 when Typhoon Maywar caused significant damage to a NASA ground station located on the island of Guam, resulting in a loss of our ability to have continuous communication with the ISS. NASA and our ISS partners continue to conduct operations in a manner that ensures crew safety as work to repair the damage continues. At the conclusion of the ISS program, scheduled for the end of 2030, the station must be deorbited in a controlled manner to ensure avoidance of populated areas on Earth. The station's safety orbit is the shared responsibility of the five space agencies that have operated it since 1998. The station partners have studied deorbit options and a newer modified spacecraft is necessary to provide high confidence deorbit capabilities. NASA is engaged with U.S. industry and is proceeding with plans to procure a spacecraft, the U.S. deorbit vehicle, that will perform the final safe deorbit maneuver of the space station. The administration has included requests for NASA Guam recovery and the deorbit vehicle and pending domestic emergency supplemental appropriation requests. NASA continues to believe that funding for both of these is a pressing requirement. Uh, after the retirement of ISS, NASA will continue its scientific research and technology work in LEO by transitioning to services provided by one or more commercial LEO destinations. It's NASA goal to be one of many customers in a robust, robust commercial marketplace. Um, in order to maintain an interrupt, uninterrupted human presence in LEO, NASA is striving to have at least one operational destination on orbit before ISS uh, is ended. We partnered with several industry teams, and we've got um, uh, a uh, hearty collaboration for additional capabilities called the Collaboration for Commercial Space Capabilities too. Working with its international and commercial partners, NASA is poised to continue groundbreaking research and development on ISS, foster the development of commercial capabilities, enabling continuity of U.S. human presence in LEO, and to safely retire the ISS at the end of its operations, as we usher in a new era of commercial space development that will transform LEO into an arena of vibrant economic activity. Uh, thanks again for inviting me to talk with you today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Bowersox. Uh, I now recognize Dr. Dittmar for five minutes to present her testimony. Good morning, Ranking Member Lofgren, Chairman Babden, Ranking Member Sorensen, and members of the committee. I appreciate very much the invitation to appear before you today, and it's especially an honor to do so with such esteemed panelists as Ken Bowersox, Dylan Taylor, and Robert Furl. My name is Dr. Mary Lynn Dittmar, and I lead both government and external relations along 850 outstanding colleagues at Axiom Space in Houston, Texas. Axiom is organized around three main business lines of business, each of which support and advance U.S. national objectives in space. First, in partnership with NASA, as mentioned by Ken, we operate private astronaut missions to the International Space Station. These missions are expanding the number of countries that can fly to space, demonstrating ongoing U.S. leadership by promoting opportunities for international collaboration, for science, and for commercial activity. Less than a week ago, in fact, we successfully completed the Axiom 3 mission, which saw astronauts from Italy, Turkey, and Sweden, and our own Commander Michael Lopez Alegria, conduct more than 150 hours of science and outreach, including engagements directed to educating and inspiring students around the world. Our second line of business is focused on building the lunar spacesuits, providing NASA astronauts with the lunar suit they will wear on the surface of the moon during the Artemis III mission. We are also working on next generation spacesuits for low Earth orbit. Our flagship program is the construction of Axiom Station, the world's first commercial space station. Our first module is nearly complete and will be arriving in Houston later this year to begin outfitting prior to a launch into orbit, where it will connect to the ISS in late 2026. An additional module will be flown into orbit next, after which Axiom Station will become free flight capable prior to the arrival of the ISS deorbit vehicle. Additional modules will follow. This is the fifth time I have had the honor to testify before Congress in the last decade. And at no other time have I felt the sense of urgency that I do now. I have written at length in my published testimony regarding the budget pressures and decisions that must be faced squarely and without delay or obfuscation in order to ensure that the United States will not surrender decades of American leadership in low Earth orbit to China. My testimony is on the record, and so I will keep the rest of my remarks short. 
First, the retirement of the International Space Station and transition to commercial LEO is the fulfillment of long-held policy in both Congress and executive branch agencies across decades from both political parties. This transition must be orderly and predictable. Second, the private astronaut missions are a critical part of our transition to a commercial LEO economy. Axiom has continued to invest in these missions and shoulders part of the cost, demonstrating our commitment to developing a new economy in space. NASA and Axiom Space are laying the groundwork for successful transition in LEO these missions, and they must continue unabated. Third, while NASA's choice to encourage competition among several potential providers of commercial stations to stimulate innovation and drive costs down was and is laudable, it did not take into full account the threat to U.S. leadership posed by China, which has vastly accelerated its own space investments, technology, and achievements in the last several years. Finally, federal funding for the transition to include money for the ISS program, the Commercial LEO Destinations Program, PAM missions, and the USD orbit vehicle that will be used to retire the ISS safely must all be in place in addition to adequately funding the ISS budget itself in order to provide the resources necessary for a successful transition. At present, there is no clear path to this outcome. Putting the transition under threat and opening the door to, US lead, to losing U.S. leadership in LEO to China in the event of a gap. The stakes are extremely high for U.S. leadership in space. The only beneficiary of an unsuccessful transition to commercial platforms, able to maintain continuous human presence, conduct science and other research, and catalyze commercial development, will be China. We cannot accept that future. If we have a gap of American presence in low Earth orbit, the only winner will be China. An immediate course correction by Congress is needed. We are making the following recommendations. Include language in a new NASA Authorization Act that reinforces and makes crystal clear that it is the policy of the United States to maintain continuous American presence in low Earth orbit in perpetuity. Reinforce that it is the policy of the United States to encourage and enable the fullest commercial use of space, a policy first put forth by Congress in 1990. Ensure that the ISS program remains a capacity through the end of life in 2030, supporting the fullest use of the ISS for exploration, science, technology development, and commercial activity. To enable that goal, authorize the ISS program funding at the 2023 level at minimum in 2025 and authorize funding for the U.S. deorbit vehicle in addition. Authorize the flight of the ISS until 2030 with the possibility of extension until one commercial station is operational. Proceed with the down select to a maximum of two CLD providers immediately. Direct NASA to accelerate contracts to CLD providers. Authorize funding of the CLD program at $295 million and appropriate commensurate funding. Thank you for your time and attention, and I look forward to your questions. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and now I'd like to recognize Dr. Furl for five minutes for his testimony. Chairman Babin, Ranking Member Sorensen, and the rest of the committee, I appreciate and am honored to be a part of this panel and present to you today the ideas about science and the role of science in this particular discussion. I represent uh, my colleague, Dr. Kristen Van Vliet from Cornell University, as we co-chaired the Committee on Biological and Physical Sciences in Space for the National Academies of Science, uh, Engineering, and Medicine. Um, it is both a pleasure and an interest to note that science has been a key part of many of the comments that have already been made today. And my role today is to secure for you the notion that that science is well thought out, that science is well directed, and that science is a result of the entire scientific community in space putting together the decadal survey that I'm going to talk to you a little bit about today. Um, I'm here to address the what and the why of going to space, the reasons that we need to be there for science and the reasons that we need to be there for discovery. Science is both the driver and the enabler of our presence in space. And our discoveries in space make possible not only the ability to go to space, but the ability to understand our universe and to better our life here on Earth. That is abundantly clear. BPS science has been, um, and our part of science, has been a part of the space exploration community since the early Apollo era. So this is, this is you know, and a historical and well-represented activity in space 
that feeds space and also derives the science from space. Our report is called Thriving in Space, Ensuring the Future of Biological and Physical Sciences. It is a chosen title for that very reason. We now wish to thrive in space. We no longer wish to just visit. We wish to occupy, live, develop, manufacture, and otherwise do what thriving means in space. And that demands a continual presence in space, and it also absolutely demands that the um, presence in space be enabled by the government. It is a national need. Biological and physical sciences is exactly the science that deals with the physical forces, the biological changes that occur in terrestrial organisms and terrestrial processes as it moves off the surface of the Earth. We learn about how to do things in space by understanding the forces and the scientific processes behind being in space. Biological and physical sciences is um, well represented in the International Space Station, as has already been mentioned with thousands of publications and experiments on the international scale. And it is very clear that not only has the International Space Station proven its value as a scientific vehicle, but it's also proven that its limitations currently exist. So we need not only the equivalent of the International Space Station, we need it, its capabilities and more. So as we transition to the commercial space, commercial LEO destination um, model, it is very clear that not only does there not not only do we need to have a continuous scientific presence, that must be fully vested scientific presence that allows these experiments to continue in the mo mode in which they are currently working and in the even better mode. It's already been mentioned that we're at a critical moment in this science and the critical moment in the distribution of our intellectual property and capabilities in space, and we are in our in our report absolutely supporting the notion that the science needs to both drive our presence in space and be continued as we move further into space. Science in the International Space Station in low Earth orbit is not substituted by the trip to the moon. It enables the trip to the moon and the more we do science in low Earth orbit, the more we enable our capabilities to move to the moon and Mars. And Conducting science in space uniquely expands our understanding of the natural universe in ways that we have yet to imagine. The International Space Station is a place where humans created the coldest place in the universe. The entire universe was created there. The coldest place was created there not to go to space, but to understand what our universe is like and to imagine products and capabilities that are beyond our current imagination. I look forward to your questions and I thank you for being here. Thank you, Dr. Furl. Uh, I'd like to now recognize Mr. Taylor for five minutes to present his testimony. Uh, Chairman Babin, uh, Ranking Member Lofgren, Ranking Member Sorensen, and distinguished members of the committee, uh, thank you for inviting me to share my perspective on the U.S. commercial space station landscape. At Voyager, we're dedicated to building a better future for humanity, both in space and here on Earth. Voyager has nearly 50 years of spaceflight heritage and unmatched experience working commercially on the ISS. The ISS transforms space exploration, and Voyager is dedicated to continuing its legacy of global diplomacy by developing a next generation platform, a commercially operated, continuously crewed, free-flying space station called Starlab. Starlab began in 2021 when Voyager was awarded $160 million under NASA's CLD program. CLD is dedicated to providing the U.S. with continuously crewed platforms prior to ISS decommissioning in 2030, preventing a space station gap. Recently, Voyager formed a U.S. majority-owned transatlantic joint venture with Airbus known as Starlab Space. We believe this joint venture provides the strongest foundation to assure the continuation of ISS diplomacy. The strongest foundation to assure the continuation of ISS diplomacy in addition to tapping the growing international customer base 
and demand for space-based science and commerce. Once built, Starlab will launch on SpaceX's Starship as early as 2028. Starlab will host four crew members continuously, provide 100% of the space station's current payload capacity, and realize a steady pipeline of advanced research in part through our ground-based George Washington Carver Science Park. We're also proud to have both Hilton Hotels and Northrop Grumman as part of our team. Since CLD's inception, the committee has provided excellent bipartisan support for the program. As we continue to build the next generation of space stations, we ask for your consideration of certain commitments to ensure CLD's success. Under CLD, NASA intends for most funding to come by private investment, unlike previous commercial programs like commercial crew and cargo resupply. These programs are successful. However, the U.S. government provided the majority of the funding in those cases. Voyager is committed to raising the majority of the needed investment for Starlab. Even so, CLD must have U.S. government support in five key areas to assure investor confidence. First, the U.S. government is fully committed to utilizing continuously crewed space stations. Second, that the ISS will be decommissioned in 2030. Third, that Congress plans to adequately fund CLDs. Fourth, regulatory support for indemnification and liability concerns. And lastly, that the U.S. government will transition critical research to CLD platforms as they become available and not compete with industry. In hand with the 2030 commitment is also the need for sufficient funding for this CLD program. A funding increase authorized by Congress will bolster investor confidence and accelerate early investment. Early investment helps address design challenges sooner, foster a customer base, and avoids costly late development changes. Lack of investment in 2024 and 2025 would jeopardize schedules for all providers and increase the risk of a gap in U.S. human presence in low Earth orbit. Lastly, we know the ISS is the greatest feat of human engineering in history. However, it will not last forever. Consequently, a large percentage of the crew's time is now dedicated to performing maintenance instead of science. This will only get more dire as the station continues to age. Additionally, the U.S. faces imminent political threats in space. China and its brand new space station, Tiangong, is already operational, and many of our allies are planned to be users. If commercial platforms are not available ahead of decommissioning, our current partner nations will have no choice but to gravitate towards China. We are in a modern space race, like the days of Apollo, and the U.S. is the leader in space and human exploration, but that leadership in the future is not assured. It is critical we carry America's legacy forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Excuse me. And now I would um, like to question, if I can find my place here. Sorry about that. Yeah. <clears throat> um, Mr. Bauer socks. <clears throat> the spacesuits worn by NASA astronauts when performing ISS extravehicular uh, activities, or EVAs, as you're well aware, are more than 40 years old and are in dire need of replacement. In 2022, after several attempts to develop a new spacesuit internally, NASA awarded a task order to Collins Aerospace to develop a new suit for LEO EVAs. NASA also awarded a task order to Axiom Space to develop a new suit for lunar EVAs. In 2023, NASA awarded a second task order to Axiom Space to develop a LEO version of Axiom's lunar spacesuit. How is NASA prioritizing the development of the LEO spacesuits versus the lunar spacesuits? So um, our current spacesuits, I just want to emphasize they're, they're working very well. Um, and, and while the design may be old, our team is really good at keeping those suits working, um, and, and, and we're happy with how they're performing. Um, we could always do better, but um, we really understand that suit well, and our team does a good job with it. 
Um, the, the new suits that we're working, there's a lot of overlap between what you would need for a lunar suit and what you would need for a suit in low Earth orbit. Um, that's why we have two providers. That's why it's possible for either provider to provide some part of some aspect of service for either the moon or low Earth orbit. Um, and we're working hard with those providers to, to try and get a, a capability on ISS uh, for the, the last few years of its life. Thank you. And ISS astronauts have experienced a range of issues with spacesuits in the past, uh, ranging from water intrusion to complications from improper sizing. How will NASA transition from the older spacesuits to the newer models? And what are the agency's contingency plans if a new problem uh, occurs? Well, one of the most important things for the new suits is that <coughs> it's a wide range of astronauts and that we can um, have a good suit that works for every member of the astronaut corps, um, whether they're small or, or tall, um, that they'll be able to work in that suit. Um, our current suit, uh, it, it works a little bit better if you're, if you're, you're taller and you have longer arms, uh, but our smaller people, like me, uh, it, it do a pretty good job in it too. Uh, but we don't want to have that problem with the new suits. So we're spending a lot of time thinking about that, um, and, and we're confident that with new equipment, new hardware, great testing, that they'll work well once they get to orbit or to the surface of the moon. Great, thank you. I have a second question, uh, and for you as well, uh, Mr. Bowersox. Last October, uh, President Biden submitted a supplemental appropriations request asking Congress to provide, among other items, uh, initial funding for a spacecraft capable of deorbiting the ISS. In October, Northrop Grumman announced that it would no longer develop its own space station under the Commercial LEO Destinations Program and instead would join Voyager's Star Lab project. Uh, this freed up $89 million <clears throat> in funding that NASA then distributed among the remaining CLD candidates. If funding USDV is a high priority and time sensitive matter for NASA, can you explain why that money was not instead used to fund the deorbit vehicle? Uh, and I have a couple of additions to that. If you just answer that one, please. Um, yes, sir. You know, in order for us to manage the pace of transition with ISS to the new commercial partners, we need multiple things. We need to have those new stations. We need to have the U.S. deorbit vehicle. Uh, and we need to have good utilization uh, on ISS um, so that we maintain our transportation and utilization capability. Um, we thought that the best use of that money was to continue effort on the commercial LEO platforms, um, but to, to try to get additional resources for the USDV. Okay, what other options did NASA consider during its analysis of alternatives? Well, uh, we looked at just about everything we could think of. Uh, if you have other ideas, we're open, into li okay. open to listening. Uh, but we looked at raising ISS to a higher orbit. We looked at breaking it into smaller parts. We looked at switching ISS to a commercial operator. Uh, we looked at um, uh, possibly bringing small elements of ISS home. Uh, and when we analyzed all of those and, and considered the cost, um, doing one uh, return of the ISS into the ocean seemed like the best option to us. Thank you. And then uh, finally, how will NASA ensure that the cost of deorbiting the ISS is shared proportionately among our international partners? Luckily, that's covered in our agreements with our international partners. Uh, we share basically, um, according to the amount of mass that each partner has on the station, the, the resources required to bring the ISS home. Okay, thank you, and uh, that completes my line of questioning, so I'd like to go to the uh, ranking member, Mr. Sorensen, for five minutes questions. Um, uh, thank you all for being here. Um, Mr. Bowersox, I'm not sure if you worked with um, someone who helped me get to where I am today. Um, Dr. Janice Voss uh, was a NASA astronaut who called my hometown of Rockford, Illinois, her hometown. Um, in the 1990s and the 2000s, um, she flew on numerous shuttle missions and helped me inspire, uh, helped inspire me as a kid to, to learn and continue to look up. Uh, she flew on Space Shuttle Discovery as, as others as well, um, which makes it appropriate that one of her flight suits is on display at the Discovery Center in Rockford, Illinois today. 
Um, so I do want to continue um, learning a little bit more about spacesuits, given the, the safety concerns in the age. Are we on target with respect to technology and time to meet the demands as we look beyond the ISS mission? First, I want to thank you for mentioning Janice. I think the world of, of that person. Uh, I, I can remember when she certified me to operate the arm uh, on the space shuttle and International Space Station, um, and, 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 and I miss her. Uh, uh, but uh, for our future astronauts, we want to make sure that, that all of our people will be able to use the new suits, so that they'll fit everyone, that everybody will have good function. Um, we also want to make sure that they're affordable. Um, so we're looking at uh, trying to increase the, the, the uh, reliability and reduce the cost of the technology that we use. And we're seeing great progress with our partners. Um, Dr. Furrow, I'll, I'll turn to you. Your written statement refers to the critical need for biological and physical science research in space to, to better inform both uh, life in low Earth orbit, uh, but also during our exploration into deep space. Can you elaborate on how your biological and physical science research and those of your colleagues will help enable human exploration to the moon and then beyond to Mars? Thank you very much for the question. It's, it's, it's an enjoyable thing to think about because how we get there, how we enable ourselves to get there, and how we can do it in a way that is both, um, both doable and um, sustainable is key, key to our ability to do it and also a key point in our decadal survey. We've recommended, in fact, two large-scale campaigns uh, in this area of science that deal with the following kinds of science. How do we take an ecology with us, our microbes, our plants, and our other um, organisms, uh, to sustain ourselves over the long term on, in wherever it is we decide to go? How do we create a mini Earth, one that doesn't need resupply? That's a big body of science that has to do with creating long-term sustainability in space. Another, another um, campaign that we've recommended is, is called Matrices, but it's, it's basically the same idea. How do we change our manufacturing concepts and the science behind our manufacturing so that we can reuse what we take with us the first time, repurpose that into something else for the second time, and the third time, and the fourth, and the fifth. Moreover, when we get, do get to the moon, how do we manage the uptake of resources there in a way that services us as humans inside the habitats that we will build? So our science underpins all of those concepts with regard to sustainability, in addition to the, the plain biological questions of what happens when you take a terrestrial organism off the surface of the Earth. Thank you for that. NASA plans to be one of the many users of commercial space stations. Uh, to Dr. Dittmar and Mr. Taylor, your companies will presumably need non-governmental customers to support your stations. How have you begun developing a pipeline of, of groups that are interested in using commercial space stations? And I'll begin with you, Dr. Dittmar. Thank you for the question. Well, as I mentioned in my um, oral testimony and written testimony, uh, one of the key approaches that we've used to begin developing that market are the private astronaut missions in partnership with NASA. Um, we began by flying individuals uh, in our first mission, AX-1, that um, basically bought the ticket uh, to go to space. But as those missions have progressed, they have increasingly revealed to all of us um, and to NASA the interest of international um, entities to participate in human spaceflight, including entities that have never been before. In Acts 2, we flew Saudi Arabia, which although it had flown representatives, flew the first Arab woman in space and did tremendous outreach in that country. Um, in Acts 3, which we just flew, Turkey and Sweden flew for the first time. Um, and we had an Italian, although Italy has flown before, um, the Air Force uh, uh, gave us uh, Colonel Villaday, who had a long history of training to fly. He was excited to go to space. Um, so what we're learning is that international um, country, other countries are very interested in our commercial, um, and commercial platforms in their use. Um, we've signed a memorandum of agreement with ESA to continue to explore opportunities there. 
Um, we signed other memorandum of agreement that it, they're all public, and I could direct you to the record, but New Zealand and others. Um, so we're finding global interest um, in doing science, research, technology development, in space manufacturing, um, as well as flying humans into space. Dr. Taylor, Mr. Taylor. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, similar to what Mary Lynn just said, we're seeing huge international demand for the station. Uh, one of the things that I think is important to, to point out is in the case of low Earth orbit, uh, these commercial stations coming online are not going to address demand, they're gonna create demand. Mm -hmm. What do I mean by that? Uh, if you look at the constraints on the International Space Station today to do science, um, a lot of that is constrained by astronaut time. And astronaut time is uh, spent in large degree to performing maintenance. So imagine a brand new commercial space station uh, with minimal maintenance where 100% of the astronaut time can be dedicated to research uh, and it's a less frictional, uh, it's a frictionless transaction to actually get research <clears throat> done. So a lot of the biopharma companies uh, who would like to do drug development on the ISS, I uh, see this as a huge opportunity to accelerate their plans. Uh, as Mary Lynn pointed out, uh, international partners, we've signed several MOUs with countries as well. I believe the UN shows 90 countries with space agencies now. Uh, that number used to be around 20. Uh, so there's a huge appetite for international uh, space commerce. Uh, and this goes back to the point I made in my oral testimony. We want those nations to gravitate towards a Western-led platform and not a Chinese-led platform. Thank you for Gentlemen, that. Gentlemen, time's expired. Uh, Mr. Posey, recognize you for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman Babin. Uh, Mr. Bowersox, are the facilities at Kennedy Space Center sufficient to meet NASA and contractor requirements for commercial space station payload processing? Um, we would like to see improvement in those facilities. We'd like to see uh, improvement in the uh, capacity for all of the, the work at the Kennedy Space Center. Um, one of the challenges we have is how we get the resources to do that. Um, and something that I think has been talked about is uh, potential legislative changes that would allow us to take resource investments from private uh, partners, commercial partners, and, and bring them in and use them at a place like the Kennedy Space Center. Okay. Is, is there any current plan to use foreign launch or payload processing facilities to service commercial space contractors? Um, right now, we're not thinking about using commercial launch for that. We want to use our own activities. We might uh, do some sort of an exchange uh, with commercial partners in, um, in other countries where uh, they provide a launch for us, we provide a launch for them. We could see something like that in the future, but, but right now we don't have anything concrete. How, how is the concept of letting the contractors participate in the development of facilities, how's that, at what stage is that now? Um, I, I think it's in uh, the stage where we're, we're seeing a need, and I think we're talking about the potential for uh, legislative uh, change. And, and for the record, I'll go back and see exactly where we are with that proposal. Um, but um, it would be very helpful if we could get contributions like that. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, Dr. Dittmar, uh, could you further explain your statement about China uh, partnering with the United Nations to select and operate international payloads? In 2019, um, China and UN Copius announced an agreement to select payloads to fly on Chang'an. Um, they selected initially nine payloads, but had opportunity uh, in that program to select others. The stated um, goal of that was to essentially do global, global outreach and involve um, payload developers and scientists who had not previously had the opportunity to flow, fly or who um, the China was particularly interested in bringing on board to the um, to, to Chang'an. Okay, I, I'd like each of you on the panel to speak to the risks, such as intellectual property theft, that uh, companies face with partnering with uh, China on a station. You want to start with Mr. Taylor and go. To the yeah, I share your concern. Um, the intellectual property risk is, is real. Uh, this is one of the arguments we're making to nations who. Uh, might see China as a, as a good deal because they're deeply discounting their um, their access, and of course that comes at a price, and the price is they're not going to control their IP. Uh, so with respect to Starlab, we take that extremely seriously. There'll be no Chinese activity on our space station, um, but I, I share your concern. I think uh, there is a real risk that conducting any kind of commerce or research on Tiangong uh, will uh, necessarily uh, have IP consequences. Thank you. Doc. 
academic scientists and commercial scientists both uh, do recognize the risk of intellectual property leakage when dealing with uh, countries that, that don't respect the same laws that we do. Um, nonetheless, we also recognize the extreme value in international cooperation. But the, the simple answer is that those risks exist and are recognized by the scientific community. Dr. Ditton. Um, I, we have an expression, which is check your IP at the hatch. Yeah, very good. I like that. Mr. Bowersox. Uh, all I'd say is that uh, here in the U.S., we try very hard to understand and protect the intellectual property rights of our partners. Um, we also try to make sure that the government has a chance to use things that are developed that are um, uh, where they've benefited from taxpayer investment. Got you covered. Uh, thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. <clears throat> okay, I now recognize the uh, gentlewoman from uh, California, Ms. Uh, Lofgren. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I uh, read a very interesting article called The Wild West of Space Research that was in Aer uh, Aerospace America. I'd like to ask unanimous consent to put this article into the record, Mr. Chairman. Um, but the um, CEO of a space-born uh, United that's in the Netherlands uh, has stated that he wants to enable human conception in space and wants to grow human embryos uh, off Earth. His quote is, the long-term goal is to enable the full cycle of nine months floating childbirth in space. Now, it's my understanding that unless you have uh, public funds in the research, pretty much you, there aren't any regulations. You can do what you want. Um, now, the U.S. government sponsored uh, research, I believe, and you can correct me if this is incorrect, um, operates under a common rule, a federal policy that is actually a collection of multiple rules to ensure that the science is both fair to human subjects and high standard, um, but that those rules don't apply uh, to commercial uh, space companies because they don't get federal money. It seems to me that the ethical framework that's based on terrestrial uh, research should apply in space. So I have a couple questions. First, Dr. Dittmar and Mr. Taylor, I'm wondering what your plans are on this issue with commercial space stations. Mr. Bowersox, I'm wondering what NASA has assessed on this issue and whether you are um, thinking about what rules or standards could be applied and whether we have jurisdiction to do that. And Dr. Furl, I'm very interested in how the academic uh, community is involved in standard setting um, and ethically, um, uh, the ethics of privately funded research. Obviously, I'm for science, but there are ethical questions here in, in some cases. And I'm also interested, if anybody can answer this, you know, China uh, ha has a, the capacity to host uh, research. Should we be worried about whether people who want to skirt ethical rules, if we can establish them, might then go to that, uh, to that platform? So in order, could you answer those questions? Thank you for that question. Um, I, uh, I had the honor to participate at the National Academies of Science on the Executive Committee of the Space Studies Board for many years. And the discussion about ethical um, constraint might be the right word or consideration. I'm not sure exactly what the right word is. I would use things like thoughtful consideration, uh, responsible behavior, if they were my words. Um, has certainly been one that, uh, that's been inherent in scientific pursuits for generations and generations. Certainly no different on orbit. Um, I will say that what we've done at Axiom is our chief scientist, Lucy Lowe, who came to us from NIH, participated in a multi-author uh, paper recently that was published in Science that addressed exactly these concerns. Thank um, you. Uh, Mr. Taylor, I, I don't want to go over my time, but I would like to hear from all the witnesses. Sure, I'll be brief. Uh, thank you for the very thoughtful question. Um, first of all, we're, as I mentioned earlier, we're doing missions on the ISS today. Mm -hmm. uh, we've ran 1,300 missions, our company has, on the ISS. Uh, so we anticipate in our business plan essentially uh, uh, 
abiding by the guidelines that we've abided by thus far. We're not anticipating any exotic research that we haven't uh, already experienced. Second is we're going to be integrating our payloads, as I mentioned earlier, in the George Washington Carver Science Park, which we're putting in Ohio. Right. So it'll be subject to U.S. law and regulation. And, and then lastly, we're going to follow all NASA requirements. So that goes to NASA and uh, Dr. Furl. What are we going to put in place? What can we put in place? Because even if these two private sector entities want to have ethics, they're clearly going to be uh, entities that it's going to be the Wild West. I know for the research that we fund uh, on the government side, we would expect to follow. No, I understand that. But all what the same about ethics? What the, about the private sector? Uh, on the private sector, we want to give them some freedom, right? Um, I would expect the government to have a large say in what they do, a large influence in what they do. But but we would try to give them freedom to do as much as they can. But if something just really exceeded what we thought were the boundaries of our ethical standards. Mm -hmm. Um, then we would have a long talk. Well, Dr. Furl, I mean, obviously, having uh, growing an embryo for nine months in space does create <laughs> and pose some ethical questions. I mean, what are we going to do about this? I, I think that the, the bigger, from my perspective, the scientific question actually has been asked and answered. Can terrestrial organisms develop in the way that they are normally developing on Earth in space? Asked and answered, yes, we can. Yes, they can. So the, the scientific basis for what you're discussing wouldn't necessarily fall into our realm. Um, I will say that scientists are, by and large, excruciatingly ethical with no, regard to no disagreement choosing, on that choosing which questions are asked and answered in space well and because scientists operate within an ethical standard so i'm not criticizing i'm for the scientists but there are some wild west actors who may not want to live within those normal constraints that's just why i'm raising the issue and my time is would agree. my time has expired mr chairman hopefully we can delve into so. this a little <clears throat> bit more later Fascinating line of questioning. Thank, thank you. Uh, now I'd like to recognize the uh, chairman of the full committee, Mr. Lucas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And let's slide back into the landlord-rental relationship here for just a moment. Uh, Mr. Bowersox, the Commercial Low Earth Orbit Development Program, CLD advances. How do you uh, view NASA's role in partnering with commercial space providers? And along that line, what are you thinking? Do you anticipate NASA acting as an uh, anchor tenant? Yes, sir. I think that's a pretty good description. We would be an anchor tenant, and we would be, um, I think, very helpful in helping the commercial providers understand what's important currently in space research. They're probably the best to understand what uh, commercial companies want and in developing that market. And um, our goal would be to become a smaller customer as time goes on. That's a very good segue. So to Dr. Dittmar and Mr. Taylor, do you agree with NASA's assessments of their role in CLD? My quick answer is we uh, absolutely look forward to hosting NASA on our platform. We're developing our platform with that in mind. Um, as I you know, our CEO is a former ISS program manager for NASA, so we have a pretty deep legacy um, in our program. As far as the question about anchor tenant, though, I think it depends on how you define it. Um, uh, you know, NASA's total um, budget that they're anticipating with regard to a CLD services contract is such that um, the transportation costs, which are continuing to grow, um, and the overall science and utilization contract will not be sufficient to sustain a commercial um, a commercial station. So it, I'm not trying to quibble. I'm just saying it really depends on how you define that term. Mr. Taylor. Yeah, I would agree with uh, Mr. Bowersox. I think anchor tenant's a good term, but I would expand it to not only NASA, I would expand it to European Space Agency, uh, JAXA, and Canadian Space Agency. Uh, and I think one of the benefits of the ISS uh, that we can all agree on is the international soft power, international diplomacy that it, that it has. And I think the commercial space stations can recreate that dynamism. And I ask this next question to all three of you, and I'm sure I'm following in the footsteps of my colleagues in the hearing so far, but how can Congress ensure that these partnerships are carried out in a responsible fashion? In other words, how are commercial providers held accountable for performance? 
Well, I, I think the questions you're asking um, here and I, that I expect in the future will be a big part of holding everybody accountable, um, watching our schedules, watching how we perform on, on cost. Uh, I, I think that'll be very important uh, in keeping all of our partners um, accountable and responsible for the investment we make in their developments. Um, just quickly, Axiom's contract with NASA, which is a little different than the other contracts, um, includes uh, data delivery, PDR, CDR. We've completed our preliminary design review uh, with NASA Oversight, and uh, we're underway with our CDR. So those are standard engineering program management um, approaches, and uh, we're deeply engaged with NASA with regard to that. And along that line, I guess the appropriate question in the eyes of our uh, other panelists, how is NASA held accountable for managing program costs? schedules and performance, because what NASA does determines their ability to utilize the asset. Any comment on that, Dr. or Mr. Bauer Sox, or anyone else? Well, I'd say you guys do a pretty good job of holding us accountable, and we appreciate that. It's important, um, and we try to That's do a good best. answer, by the way. Right? <laughs> but, but I'll also say that, you know, we don't want to be driven completely by schedule. We want to think about whether or not we're really ready, whether the platforms are safe, and that we'll have a good uh, platform to operate. So we're also looking at that performance. Please. There's another aspect to consider here in terms of anchor tenancy and responsibility. Um, there is an entire body of science that is the anchor tenant, not necessarily a particular agency. The NIH, the NSF, and others are now involved in ISS research and I suggest that the concept of anchor tenancy be viewed in, in that way, in addition to NASA as a particular agency. And in that regard, I'll just cycle back to responsibility and who keeps them in, 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 in line. Um, the National Academies does have committees that oversee these, these areas of science and does so on an annual basis. Let me ask uh, one other question, one other observation, Dr. Barstock. I want to follow up with a question broached by Dr. Babin. Each international partner is responsible for a share of the orbit cost, and it is proportionate to the amount of mass the partner contributes to the space station. Is NASA assuming the uh, full cost of deorbiting the ISS? Um, well, sir, we, we don't exchange funds usually in those relationships. There's some offset between the partners, some sort of a, a trade that we make, um, but that's proportional to mass, and everybody will share that, that burden. With that, my time has expired, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to recognize the gentleman from uh, Alabama, Mr. Strong. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Congress recently authorized the ISS through 2030 as NASA works to transition to commercial low Earth orbit destinations. At the same time, as our witnesses mentioned, China is aggressively seeking partnerships for its space station and Russia's future on the ISS is uncertain after 2025. Unless commercial uh, stations are uh, ready before 2030, NASA could face a station gap that would set the United States back significantly. Mr. Bauer Sox, how is NASA ensuring that CLDS will be ready before 2030 to prevent this? Well, uh, the, the biggest thing we're doing is uh, trying to set up new contracts, new procurements, and uh, trying to work to get resources so that we can develop those new platforms along with commercial partners. Um, of course, with the um, constrained resource environment that uh, we are expecting in the future, that may be difficult. It may be difficult to maintain the utilization on the ISS, prepare the U.S. orbit vehicle, and to prepare the commercial platforms uh, with constraints that could be ahead of us. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Dittmore, uh, first of all, thank you for your service to the University of Alabama in Huntsville. Uh, you were an assistant professor uh, when I was a student there, and it's, uh, we're honored to have you here today. Uh, Dr. Dittmore and uh, Mr. Taylor, if NASA keeps prolonging the ISS uh, decommissioning date beyond 2030, what impact will this have on CLD investors in the market? Uncertainty with regard to the end of life for the station, of course, raises the specter for investors and customers both that they will be on a platform that has to compete with the government. So that's the that's the critical issue. On the other hand, um, this is threading a needle, and, and we certainly recognize that. Um, the stated end of life of the ISS at 2030 has been very helpful, um, but we are concerned also that there be no gap. Yeah, thank you. 
Yeah, I would concur with Dr. Dittmore. It's absolutely critical that we maintain consistency with that date uh, because investors are underwriting based upon uh, a timeline. So the timeline changes, the underwriting changes, the investment thesis changes. Totally agree. NASA recently updated its RFP for the U.S. Uh, deorbit vehicle, a spacecraft meant to safely deorbit the ISS as part of its planned retirement. With the RFP deadline just passing a couple of days ago, how can NASA centers like Marshall uh, with rich expertise in advanced space um, transportation systems work with commercial space companies to safely deorbit the ISS? And that's to any of you that would like to answer. Well, I, I'd love to take that question. You know, Marshall has a great history and, and a wonderful depth of expertise there. Um, we use them in... Uh, all of our programs to ad advise and monitor the work of commercial partners, all of our commercial programs, and I would expect something similar in the work with the U.S. Drew Orbit Vehicle Provider. Thank you. Uh, is there uh, a plan to use FAA-approved FAA reentry sites like Huntsville International Airport in Huntsville, Alabama, to help with the deorbit and future CLD missions? The, um, the, the one provider that we would have uh, that might be able to use a, a, a runway like that would be Sierra Nevada's Dream Chaser. Um, whether or not the Sierra Nevada folks are looking at Huntsville, I can't tell you for sure, sir. They are. It's certified. Okay. Well, great. Thank you. Um, and it's the second longest runway in the Southeast United States, only second to Miami. And I think that that is a great way to bring those reentry uh, vehicles back in. Dream chaser for one, but we've got to look at other options so that we can do that. The certification uh, to be able to get an airport certified. I went through that as the chairman of the Madison County Commission, uh, where I previously served before here, and it's a painful process. Uh, I've Mr. Bowers, there Sox, a lot. it's a great airport. <laughs> that's great, thank you, uh, Mr. Bower Sox. As you know, Marshall Space Flight Center hosts the ISS Payload Mission Control Center, which manages many research payloads um, aboard the ISS. How does NASA plan to ensure that researchers can seamlessly transition their experiments from the ISS uh, to the CLDS as they become available? Well, working with our commercial partners, um, I anticipate that uh, some of the investigations that are currently being conducted on ISS will move to the commercial platforms. Um, how we work with the payload operations uh, control center there at uh, Huntsville is still something we need to work out, but I see a role for those people in the future because of their skills. Thank you. I thank each of you for your testimony today. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. And uh, I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Georgia, Dr. McCormick. Thank you, Dr. Chair. <laughs> it's a really important uh, subject, and, and uh, I think it's often overlooked, often misunderstood uh, what's at stake here, especially in this new technolo technological age uh, where we have so many vehicles in the low or orbit um, uh, and, and what it means to us going forward. So I'm going to set the table for the one thing that I'm focused on, and that's the International Space Station and its decommissioning. And, and uh, I'm not worried about the safety, but I'm worried about the time frame and our mission accomplishment of what we want to achieve going forward. I just kind of set the table as we look to the future of the uh, International Space Station and American low orb or orbit activities. It's obviously up to us as the elected officials in Congress to take ownership of this U.S. space policy and maintain leadership across the globe. Last year, the committee passed the Commercial Space Act of 2023 which will support America's budding and commercial space economy as it streamlines the regulatory environment, ensures compliance with international treaty obligations, reduces, reduces administrative burdens, hopefully, and promotes the best practices in orbit. At the same time, the Biden administration released their proposed proposal after months of delay. Their proposal would lead to increased multi-agency bureaucracy, raid tape, and opaque application process and a ton of uncertainty for our space industry partners as they're trying to plan for the future. The Biden administration proposal will directly undermine the work of NASA and the U.S. having been pursuing over in the, the short and long term to support commercial lower Earth orbit development. This is my concern. Congress must continue to promote a transparent, responsible environment here at home that will strengthen our domestic industry and encourage innovation. The International Space Station has served as a home to humans and scientific research for more than 20 years. The International Space Station is one of a kind, and it's great in advancing technologies, innovation, and industry. 
as the commercial industry aims to take the mantle, it is vital that our government does all we can to assure a smooth transition, both for economic prosperity and national security interests, meaning making it easier, not harder. My concern is this. When we're talking about that, that beneficial timeline, uh, Dr. Dittmer, I, I wanted to say in your testimony you had said how you discussed an American presence in low Earth orbit is under the threat and how the likelihood of a gap, this is what I'm worried about, in LEO following the decommissioning of the ISS has never been greater. Um, what concerns do you have with the proposed mission authorization system by the Biden administration specifically? And how could it disrupt the plans by NASA to shift from the International Space Station to commercial stations by the end of the decade? Thank you for the question, Dr. McCormick. Uh, we are very concerned about the proposal. We are concerned about its bifurcated nature with uh, some of the aspects of what would be happening on orbit being handled by one federal agency and then other aspects being handled by another federal agency. We think that there is a great deal of room for communication difficulty between the agencies. There's an interagency process that is sort of called for by the proposal that would require collaboration and discussion. We're concerned about delays that might be imposed by that. Um, we think that there's basically a lot of questions to be answered. The devil is in the details, so to speak. Um, regulatory frameworks need to be streamlined as much as possible. Nobody argues with the need for regulation, as was mentioned before. I'm sitting here as the industry co-chair of the FAA um, Space Advisory or Rulemaking Committee right now for commercial human spaceflight occupant safety. I wouldn't be doing it if I didn't think it was a worthwhile effort. However, I do, we do have a great deal of concern with the structure of the proposal. So I think it is important to be safe, and I think we're going to do a great job of decommissioning. Uh, we have great scientists. Everybody wants to do this the right way. What I'm worried about is the regulatory burdens that, that, oh, that come from the Biden administration that will slow down our progress in a mission accomplishment. When we talk about outpacing our enemy, I'm a, I'm a Marine first, and when we do an outpacing of our enemy, we have to make sure we don't have gaps. We don't have a uh, regulatory burden that's going to slow us down, that it's not a whole bunch of agencies weighing in on one thing, and, and my concern is specifically... Um, do you think it would be beneficial if the industry instead interacted with a one-stop shop government entity with technological expertise in order to meet the stated objective of Congress, Congress, that there be continuous American presence in the low Earth orbit? Yes. Pretty simple. That's my singular focus, and I want to leave it with that. Less regulation. Be safe. Let's get the mission done first. And with that, I yield. Amen. Thank you very much, Doc. <clears throat> Appreciate you. And... Uh, so I'll recognize my friend from uh, Florida, Mr. Webster. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Dr. Dittmer, the, the, I guess uh, most of the things have been explained in, in the fact that uh, we're headed towards this uh, uh, possible gap in spending uh, at some point in time, gap in, in presence in the uh, lower orbit. So, is, would one of the options be to uh, keep the uh, ISS afloat? I'm inclined to defer to Mr. Bowersox, but let me just give you a quick, actually will defer to Mr. Bowersox, but I'll say something first. Um, the thing I'm going to say first is, as we previously discussed, uh, having an uncertain end date for the International Space Station is really detrimental to commercial development of low Earth orbit because it creates a great deal of uncertainty with regard to vesters. Uh, Mr. Taylor did a wonderful job of capturing um, some of the concerns there. And so while there is an option to continue, a technical option um, to continue ISS, and one of our recommendations is that it does stay in orbit until there's a commercial platform that's, th that's there or launching there, um, not one second longer. Not one second longer would be our perspective. So um, I just want to emphasize that our approach to um, avoiding any gap in low Earth orbit is to do everything we can to make the commercial LEO development, uh, the commercial LEO destinations available before 2030. Um, we're, we're committed to deorbit ISS starting in 2030, um, and, and we're going to work with you to try and get the resources to do that. Okay, so if that be the case, um, well, number one, the uncertainty would go away if we were to plan for a extended life. I guess you could do that uh, or something else. But now I'm hearing, I heard uh, 2000, 
28 because the Russians have problems, so forth. They want to do that. Now they're down to 2025, could be that date. So that's pretty uncertain in itself. So um, how, what are the benefits and advantages of, of space stations uh, that are commercial space stations uh, as a as part of this solution, okay, there, we understand there'd be a scientific advantage to having those, but but what else would uh, it be able? How how would that benefit us in the uh, sort of the decommissioning of the current ISS? Well, so um, we've got commitment from our Russian partners to go through 2028, um, and our the rest of the ISS partners are working towards 2030 as the the last date for full utilization, and then ISS deorbit would start after that point. Um, we expect that our Russian partners will work to see what they can do after 2028. They have some technical concerns. They also have some budget concerns. Um, a lot of the reason that they have haven't extended past 2028 is just the way their budget system works. And um, we have a really good technical relationship with our Russian partners, and uh, and we're looking forward to hearing from them that they're ready to to stay with us through 2030. Uh, that's very important. I'm just going to jump in really quickly here. I will say Axiom and, and Voyager, and I'm sure, are working very diligently to make certain that we have capabilities on orbit prior to the end of ISS decommissioning, I mean, prior to the end, end of, of life. I would just point out that things happen. Between when we made our proposal and were granted our award, okay, um, and then started to actually bend metal on our station, there was a pandemic. Um, and then there were vendor and supply issues, which the entire airspace and defense sector are still trying to deal with. So although we're working very digitally and believe that we'll be able to do this, um, there is a tremendous budget crunch coming. And Congress needs to step up, um, in my opinion, okay, and basically make sure that we are on a path to ensure that there is no gap in low Earth orbit. And I think we can uh, set some criteria uh, for the transition, agree on some criteria for the transition, um, be bound by those criteria perhaps rather than dates. But I want to emphasize our commitment to switching to the commercial destinations. That's our future in low Earth orbit, and, and we're committed to all our partners to work with them to get them to, to low Earth orbit. So would, it, so would um, moving that date forward for commercial uh, um commercialization of the program be better for the uh, the date for com decommissioning the ISS? Well, um, just how much we could move it forward now, I'm, I, I don't know. I think it could be pretty hard just because space development is a tough business. Um, but if, if our commercial partners are ready earlier, then I think, again, in a criteria-based approach, we could consider uh, a transition earlier. Thank you very much. Yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to recognize the gentlewoman from Colorado, Ms. Carveo. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you to you and Ranking Member Sorensen for holding this hearing. Uh, and thank you to the witnesses for joining us today. I am very grateful to be on the subcommittee because I get the chance to bring Colorado's voice to the table on space issues. Uh, Colorado has been able to contribute a tremendous amount to the ISS from research being conducted on board to uh, um, its astronauts and more. I will also continue to be involved as it becomes a, it, sorry, Colorado will also continue to be involved as it becomes a development hub for the next generation of space stations. Today, I wanted to dig into a topic I'm curious about as a physician, specifically the research being done on the ISS that has medical applications back here at home. It's my understanding that there is currently research being done on the ISS on cancer immunotherapy um, and a drug specifically that um, if applied back to Earth would allow a patient to get a shot in a doctor's office versus being attached to an IV in a hospital. As you can imagine, this could prove to be a game changer for patients like the ones I see in clinic. Uh, and this really drives home how important it is for Americans that we continue to, to do research at the ISS and beyond. So for Mr. Bowersox, uh, sometimes the importance of the research that happens in space, I think, gets lost in translation between the federal government and our constituents. Uh, so what is NASA doing to help emphasize its importance uh, with the public, and how can Congress help? 
Well, first of all, we try to talk about the research and the work being done at ISS every chance we get. Um, but the, the one thing I would encourage you and the rest of the members of the panel and the folks listening is to go to the ISS Benefits for Humanity. Just do that on an internet search engine, go to that website, and you'll be amazed at all the information there and all that you can learn about the work that's going on on International Space Station. Perfect. I will definitely do that. And aside from communicating this work to Americans, one of the questions that always comes up is cost, right? Is the amount of money that we're spending um, uh, making a difference um, when it comes to research in space? The Decadal survey has identified uncertainties with the cost of doing research that will be shared in the future beyond the ISS. Uh, so for Dr. Furl, does the Decadal survey make any recommendations on how these costs uh, should be shared in the future? The Decadal study makes some very clear recommendations on the total costs that are anticipated for the body of science needed over the next decade. How those costs will be shared is, is something I'm, I might need a little more guidance on with regard to answering. But very clearly, this area of science is a small percentage of the NASA total budget and a small percentage of the, of the budget of the science mission directorate. Yet it both underpins all of the development and engineering for our future exploration efforts, as well as feeds back the very important biological and also physical advances that are applied back on Earth. So we're very strong in saying that there needs to be more budget, clearly, for the, the very science that both embodies and enables the space in low Earth orbit. And I think importantly saves time um, and money for people if it changes the ability uh, to treat certain diseases back um, here at home. Um, continuing with the cost, what can NASA do to provide clarity on future costs of conducting biological and physical sciences research from low Earth orbit after ISS? Another thing that we address in the decadal study is the absolute need for clarity with regard to costs, as some of our um, uh, my fellow panelists have mentioned the cost uh, to go to orbit, the cost for lifting, the cost of astronaut time. These are all things that need to be addressed in a more transparent way so that the, the fundamental cost of doing the research you mentioned is understood from end to end, not just for the time. Well, thank you all um, so much for your time here today and uh, for the work that you do every day that translates from space um, into uh, directly even uh, taking care of patients um, in clinic. And so I appreciate uh, the, the work. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I think that's the, the end of the first round of questions. But uh, the uh, ranking member and I have uh, put our heads together and thought that we might come, come back with a few more <laughs> questions. if. If uh, you will indulge us, uh, you great witnesses, appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to continue a line of questioning uh, on where we've uh, been talking about decommissioning and shared expenses on the ISS. The ISS partners minimize the exchange of funds for operation of the space station by operating through an in-kind barter system. Uh, can you explain to the committee how NASA negotiates these barter agreements with international partners? How, how does NASA determine the value of bartered goods and services? For instance, how can the taxpayer trace whether certain components like Russian progress vehicles have already been accounted for in, earlier, uh, in an earlier deal? Uh, who would like to answer that? Mr. Bowersox? And, and, and because that's a very detailed question, it's probably best that I take it for the record and get something um, you know, substantial back to you. But our folks are okay. very careful in the ISS program trying to make sure that, that we get very good uh, value for what we invest and that we um, see similar investments from our partners. You know, we're very careful about it. Um, but um, it is one of those areas where sometimes there's give and take, right? We, we know that one of our partners needs something, we'll make sure that they get that, they know we need something, and they make sure that, that we get it, right? So there is a little <clears throat> bit of fuzziness there. I don't wanna say it's always a perfect exchange. Gotcha, anybody else wanna add to that? Okay, and then again, Mr. Bowersox, in the last two years, uh, we have seen multiple mechanical issues on the ISS. 
Uh, these have largely occurred on the Russian segment. Uh, do you anticipate these issues increasing between now and 2028, the date that the Russians have given us? How do these technical issues impact the cost of ISS operations and maintenance for the United States? And how does NASA work uh, with the Russians to ensure that these issues are being adequately addressed? So first, um, we are working very well with our Russian colleagues um, on these issues. They're sharing information with us. We're sharing ex expertise with them with the goal of addressing these issues and trying to uh, make sure that, that we reduce the chance of things happening in the future. We're also getting valuable data. You know, some of the things we're seeing as the, the Russian segment ages, its modules are older than a lot of the, the uh, other modules that are on station. We're learning about how spacecraft age in space. So we're all getting valuable data there. Um, and then um, something that we've learned with the, the recent um, problems with the progress and uh, Soyuz vehicles and the, the radiator that, that leaked is that we, we think the orbital debris environment is something that's a big issue for all of us, right. uh, including our Russian colleagues. So we're, we're trying to understand that better. Okay, thank you. And I, that, that completes uh, my line of questioning, so I will uh, go ahead and uh, let thank my you, counterpart. Thank you. So um, I want to go back to, um, there was an event that happened this past Sunday. You may have heard of it. It was a sports game that had a, a, a concert in the middle of it, okay? Um, I think people need to understand that what we're talking about here with the International Space Station would barely fit between the goalposts of a football field. So, Mr. Bowersox, could you um, help us visualize in our head, because this is something that's never happened before, how we decommission the International Space Station, how do we make sure that the people on Earth are safe, how do we keep something so massive away from the things that are in low Earth orbit that we rely upon every day? So our, our number one strategy right now for keeping the ISS flying and, and minimizing any chance of an uncontrolled entry is to keep it in the best shape we can, uh, taking care of every maintenance item as it needs to be taken care of and maximizing the redundancy everywhere we can across the station. Um, if it were to come down in an uncontrolled fashion, there would be large pieces of the International Space Station coming down somewhere between its northern orbit limit and its southern orbit limit uh, in a part of the world we don't know, and there would be a large risk to the population on the surface of the Earth. Could, um, could you explain to us how we need to develop the, 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 the piece of machinery that is going to help us bring this down? So what we've got in mind is uh, the U.S. deorbit vehicle. What it does is basically um, it, it'll go up there, it'll wait uh, six months or a year, and then gradually the ISS will start to come down lower towards the Earth uh, just because of the high levels of the atmosphere causing drag on the space station. And then as it gets down to its uh, final altitude, we'll do an impulse from that, that deorbit vehicle, and that will cause the... Um, ISS to come down in a much smaller area of the Indian Ocean is likely where we would target it up as far as we can from landmass and as far away from people as we can get it. And that, that greatly lowers the risk to people on the surface of the Earth to, to our goal of 1 in 10,000, below 1 in 10,000 risk to anybody on the surface. But that only happens is if we are going to budget to pay for that over time. It, it requires investment in that U.S. deorbit vehicle. Um, yes, sir. My last line of questioning, um, I, I, I'm so um, optimistic seeing all of the young adults that are sitting here in this committee room today. Um, the young adults, that wh whether they're in college or they're in high school or going back to, you know, into elementary school, they're going to come up with some major, major solutions to challenges we have. Um, and maybe we could go to Dr. For, for this. Um, what are some of the things that we don't yet know that we're going to need to figure out as we transition from ISS to low Earth orbit to the moon to, to Mars? There's a actually a large number of things, and that's, that's what the decadal study is, is there to do, is to prioritize some of the things that we don't know as, as, as we make best use of the ISS and our ability 
to do science in space. So what are among, among the things we don't know? For example, um, probably represented behind me are a number of different, what we would call in the science world, genotypes. People that come from different um, backgrounds and carry different genes with them when they go into space. I'm sure Mr. Barasox will acknowledge that, that the variability of people in space and their ability to adapt to space is something that is inherent in our individual genomes. We need to know that better as more and more people go to space. So the, the, the diversity of genotype on the biological side is something that is just absolutely key in the coming decades as more and more people go to space. I, I have to add one more thing. Okay. It's the young people that were mentioned earlier, the, the grade school people that will be going into space. They will be able to go to space to do science. There will be scientists going to space more than, more than professional astronauts. And that is another thing where the science community and the unknowns that will carry people into space will be one of the drivers that takes people to space. Well, one of my heroes from my hometown, Dr. Janice Voss, she wasn't interested in science until she was six years old. Her mother says she picked up a book and it was about a woman scientist. And so thank you all for your testimony today. And thank you to the late Janice Voss for inspiring us. Thank you very much. Um, and I was going to mention them earlier, but most of them have left. Uh, but we have had literally dozens of young student age, young adults that have been coming in and out uh, during this entire hearing. And uh, when I was prepared to, to uh, make that announcement, Right before I did, they all left. So <laughs> there's still some young people in here. Mr. Stalmer, thank you for being one of the young folks here, too, okay? <laughs> uh, we really appreciate everybody that's come here today and really want to uh, say thank you to our witnesses here in a very fascinating uh, hearing, uh, which has given us some valuable information. So I want to thank you all. The record will remain open for 10 days for additional comments and written questions from all the members. So with that, this hearing is adjourned.